Hi, everyone. An official hello to all of you. And thank you for being here for our author, author talk series, discussion series that we have going on for our AI and equality community publication, Revisions of Now and Future. Um, today, we're going to have a talk and then a discussion with Yuna Shin, who wrote a piece for us called Not Losing Ourselves to the AI Storm. Um, I won't do too much talking. I'll let Yuna introduce herself and just take it away with the presentation. And thank you so much for being here. Hey, I'm excited. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so I submitted this article um, to the publication, and I'm really excited because it creates some interesting connections to art and pop culture. And so I'll just give a brief introduction about who I am. And um, yeah, this is really just like a walkthrough of what I wrote and a little bit adding some more examples in it. So it might be a refresher if you've already read it um, or uh, if this is new, then welcome to this topic. <laughs> um, so a little bit about me is I'm a designer based in Seattle and my background is in interaction design with a focus on critical design. So really trying to imagine a better world we live in through envisioning and speculative design work. I currently work at a um, strategy and design studio called Artifact, where we work with clients across tech, health, and education. But outside of my like day-to-day -day job, I just genuinely like love uh, making connections between design and contemporary art and digital pop culture through writing. And so I'm someone who really likes to make connections that you wouldn't really consider, like maybe investigating who are we without our algorithms or uh, why maybe the metaverse isn't all that great. And so with these pieces of writing, like I really tried to generate ways of reframing our approach through these topics, uh, on these topics. So I think uh, that's where design steps in. Not only can we use design as a tool to critique, but we can also use it as a generative way of finding new solutions and frameworks. And so I'll walk through uh, three sections. The first one starting off with our current situation, how this AI hype is really changing the way we think about process and as a result, shifting our values. And then I'll end on this question of, you know, what makes us us when we talk about the future of AI and our role in that story. So this article really started from a place of awe and worry and anxiety because every day I felt like another app or online service that I use on a regular basis had an update with some type of AI feature. So it felt very chaotic and overwhelming. Um, so even though I wrote this article back in spring, I'm still getting bombarded with new AI features. Just yesterday, I got an update for Figma, this design um, prototyping tool with new AI features. Uh, even in Zoom, there's an AI companion. So really it's just AI is literally everywhere in everyday like consumer products. And they all make this really big claim that it will help you be more efficient, better at a task. Um, and truly meet you where you're at for a more personalized experience. But behind this, this like rosy picture, there's actually a lot of ethical concerns that we know of about how our data is being handled and how we might navigate these edge cases um, with AI. So it really opens this big question of how do I engage with AI in my day-to-day? -day? At what point do I reach out to chat GPT to help me decide what to make for dinner? Should I have um, it write my essay for me? And so ultimately this question I'm trying to parse through is how do I coexist with this AI hype in my life when it's being marketed to me constantly and there's this tension of maybe feeling guilty of using it um, in my thinking process, especially creatively? But this isn't new. Uh, when we think about the past, like cameras have really changed the way we document and share visual experiences beyond traditional forms of craft, like painting. Um, and so when that the camera came out, it kind of like caused a bit of chaos in what we value in art. Um, and so similarly, AI is sh reshaping how we process, analyze, and problem solve. And so the thing is, this leap from um, like just going from like spell check to like chat GPT's ability to rewrite a paragraph and like Shakespearean dialect really lands us with this new question of, you know, what deserves our attention and praise? 
Do we devalue an artwork made with stable diffusion over in a piece like actually painted by a human? Um, and so this rethinking of values is really similar to the anti-art movement in the um, early 1900s. And so this movement was led by artists who purposely rejected prior definitions of what art is. So instead of thinking about art being more about the craft and being really detailed and realistic, um, really shifted when things like um, like pop art, Andy Warhol, um, this duct taped banana that sold for over $100,000, it creates this frustration of like, oh, I could do that. But like, that's kind of the point of it because um, instead it's more about the ideas and concepts that the artist is trying to bring up through these pieces rather than the actual craftsmanship. And so AI also invites us to reject conventional tools and processes. Um, and so one example that I write about in my article is during 1917, um, this French artist named Marcel Duchamp submitted a store-bought urinal um, to a gallery. And this caused an insane uproar. And it was actually rejected by the committee because it's not fine art, it's not art at all. But this attempt by Duchamp really expanded and confronted our imagination of what is considered art. Um, so instead of focusing on craft of a physical artwork, like a more traditional painting like Mona Lisa, um, anti-art really paved the way for ideas and concepts explored by the artist to be valued in more dynamic ways like performance, video, sculpture, and installations. So even today, when, when we think about the Mona Lisa, like what do we really value or appreciate about it? Um, and so I think art really creates an opportunity of uh, putting our values on spotlight. And when there is hype around a certain thing, it says a lot about what we care about and what we think is worthy of our attention. Um, and so this, it, so then in my article, I have this like visual of the Mona Lisa and this artwork generated by AI. So one took four years to make, the other one takes 20 minutes to maybe um, get to render. Um, and so, yeah, do we consider the one AI generated less valuable than the one painted by hand? So again, we were facing this dilemma of, um, yeah, like how do we think about collaboration with AI? Um, and so as a result of how AI is changing how we create, and that we have all these tools at our fingertips, it's also changing what we're creating. Um, and so something that I thought was really interesting is like this viral um, post, I guess it's not on Twitter anymore, on X of Pope Francis, where it is not real, but it went viral because people thought it was real. You can see like the hands a bit, um, the right hand is a bit like off and there's just elements that are a bit not very realistic, uh, but still it went viral. And so this is just an exam one example of many of how the AI hype storm is taking storm in our digital spaces where the democratization of user privacy and autonomy is not being kept up. So for example, Twitter and Meta launched a paid product version of their platforms that grants additional verification and visibility features um, for people who pay for that service. And so overall, currently, there's just a high risk for an increased chance for misinformation, fake profiles, trolls, and bots. And so in my article, I talk about how with this intensifying um, presence of AI blurring what is human and what is artificial, this need for authentication and transparency is needed more than ever, but it seems like all these big uh, digital platforms are really not putting that at the forefront and even putting a paywall on it. Um, okay, there's my little animation, but okay. So then I also was thinking about how in the fashion community, this big red boots that was inspired, I think, by Astro Boy. It has a lot of resemblance to this anime series from back in the day. Um, really highlights how 
hyper real uh, fashion trends are coming back in. And I was like, ooh, why why is it? Why is it that we're super intrigued by these really uncanny um, objects that resemble a more cartoonish or digital um, pixelated reality? And so again, these boots blur what is real and unreal in some similar ways to AI. It's really intriguing. You can't you're, get your eyes away from it. It almost draws you in because um, you kind of do that second take. Like, is that real? Is that tweet of um, the Pope wearing a big stylish puffer real? Um, and so, but the thing that I also make a point about this is, uh, when you look at the person wearing the big red boots, it really creates a stark contrast between, you know, like what exists in the real world and the qualities of this like imperfect world that we can't copy over in digital spaces. Um, and so when you see the big red boots on this person, her surroundings are so contrasted with this more cartoonish thing. And I think it just highlights what is real versus what is not real and there's just these really fine details in this real world that um yeah can never be replaced um and so when I was thinking about this presentation I also thought of another example of how meta just launches very I think kind of scary feature where there's 28 plus like AIs in data and so what that means is they're getting these celebrities like Kendall Jenner uh, football players, these famous personalities to become an AI character. And so you can message them and then like an AI bot, I think that is trained with their persona responds and then posts are all AI generated, but with um, this like character, this real influencer in mind. Um, and it feels really off putting when you look at their posts, their smiles that are like generated by AI. They, um, it just feels, um, not real a bit. And I don't, I'm unsure if that uncanny feeling will ever go away. Similar to those big red boots. Like even if we do bring in elements in both directions, um, yeah. Like, is there one we're more drawn to? And I'm personally more drawn to the real world. Um, and so ultimately, I think rather than a bot AI bot takeover, our responsibilities will expand in new ways as designers, programmers, educators, students, even just like casual users. And there's a really big need for a new type of digital literacy that can help us address this tension between the user and AI of knowing what to ask, how to push back, and when to accept an outcome. Um, so for example, uh, an article by the City Lab uh, featured this designer named Tim Few, who describes how a lot of architects are using mid-journey to generate um, a lot of concepts um, for like quick ideation, which is something I also do in my practice. Um, but this designer mentions a lot of flaws in this. So even though you can rapidly generate images that helps with like early stages of a project. These images often lack a lot of detail. And this, they also notice how um, the AI art generator's understanding of non-Western architecture was really lacking. Um, so again, we just have to be careful of like, um, not just taking everything to tr um, full truth value uh, when using these tools. Also this very famous um, opinion piece on the New York Times, mentions how, uh, yeah, like chat GPT's tendency to either generate, chat GPT either generates an excessive amount of information or it doesn't create, it doesn't produce like a strong stance on a specific thing you ask it. And so again, this idea of how do we make it, the this collaboration with AI, um, a new type of, well, I guess, how do we rethink our collaboration with AI? And one um, example of this that I think is being done pretty well is actually AI's collaborative or collaborative, collaborative articles on LinkedIn. Um, and so this starts with a pre-written article by AI and then experts on the platform with 
relevant skills based on the topic in that article can add context and information. And so it uses AI as a jumping off point for discussion and emulates kind of that back and forth that happens in comment sections. So I feel like this is one way where we can have a more human intervention um, that creates space for us to be skeptical and voice any of our concerns or our own ideas so that it's the core of any AI output. Um, okay. And so another thing that I mentioned in my article is that chat GPT creates like this foggy interpolation of like the web. And so instead of, you know, I think something that we forget about AI is that it's using training data to predict what's next in the sequence. So instead of, yeah, so sometimes when we like generate an answer, um, an output using AI, we don't understand how we got there. So again, this idea of like process is almost completely eliminated versus a more simple example is like typing something in Google and you can kind of see the trail of uh, your discovery and exploration of a specific topic. And so I land on this idea that AI kind of dreams of the past. Oh, yeah. AI lives in the past and dreams of the future. And so I think that ultimately we don't need AI to dream big because it really just repackages the past to remix something new as a future possibility. And it's up to us how we interpret that and take action on it. Um, and so a big question I end on is, you know, if we treat AI as the end all be all for creativity, learning and productivity and innovation, there's a risk of losing our sense of self and what we stand for. Um, so as I mentioned that, like with all these examples I have, it really just shows that, you know, it's really us as humans who can dream of the future, think of ideas, do something with this output that AI gives us in meaningful ways to make those connections. Uh, because again, like generative AI exists for your text input, but it lives to anticipate, but actually doesn't live. And sometimes I think we can lose sight of that and put a bit too much um, in the hands of AI. Thank you for going down that rabbit hole with me. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, I can take any questions or comments or thoughts. Thank you so much. That was great. Also, I just wanted to shout out your line about how like AI lives in the past and dreams of the future. Also, when you wrote that, I was just like, like, it just, I, I loved how you, I loved how you wrote that and how you said it. Um, I think it's a, a perfect way of describing kind of the situation we're in currently. Um, I definitely have a lot of questions for you, but I want to open it up to anyone if they want to put in the chat or maybe just unmute themselves if anyone wanted to ask any questions and obviously keep this like a flowing discussion. But if no one has any, I can go go ahead and say mine. Okay, cool. Yeah, feel free to put them in the chat um, as we talk and jump in at any moment for those of you that are here. Um, my first question, I just kind of wanted to learn more about your background was how you became interested in generative AI in general. Yeah, uh, I guess being at a design studio, we get like a variety of client work and um, understandably AI is very hot right now in industry. And so that has come up a lot in projects. So I think also, um, oh my goodness, sorry. I don't know why that's dropped. Uh, did, oh, oh, sorry, okay. I, I stopped. Oh, you okay, no, you're all good. <laughs> that my computer was doing something. Um, yeah, and so I guess... I've, in a way, through my work, have been, like, I have to, like, learn what's the difference between generative and traditional AI and all those terms. So, like, one client was, like, Microsoft Responsible AI, Office of Responsible, Microsoft's Office of Responsible AI. Um, and so, like, with these clients, they have a really deep understanding of the, these topics. And so there's a transfer of knowledge that happens there. But also, just as a designer, um, the tools we're using more and more like AI is being incorporated in it. And so there's moments where we've been using like stable diffusion to um, generate imagery for our storyboards in a really quick and scrappy way. 
or using chat GPT to write filler text for like wireframes we're making. Um, and so I guess that's like my more like industry interest in AI, but also just personally as a concerned person, um, being overwhelmed and scared and, uh, yeah, I'm like one way for me to like make sense of this is thinking about our value as humans and how I think about my creative process and how what I'm not willing to give up uh, when I collaborate with AI. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. And you briefly mentioned this too in your talk, but I was wondering if you could talk more about your own experience using AI as a designer. If you do use it in your work, you mentioned you see it, but I was wondering if it's something you implement in your practice. Yeah. Yeah. One thing is like stable diffusion. Um, I think like mid journey is now like a paid subscription, but like even for me, just using like stable diffusion, they've made a new version called XL where the images are just like very high quality and it's free. Uh, you don't need to pay for it, but, um, yeah, I've been using that for like storyboarding. And so again, this idea of like, Ooh, do we really need to like hand sketch that when we can just type it a prompt and it like creates a set of images that are all in the same style. That's been really helpful. Um, yeah, like Figma, they acquired a startup called Magician. So they're incorporating a lot of AI features. And I feel like it's, uh, I don't use it as much in my day to day in that uh, program. I don't know if you're familiar with Figma. It's like a prototyping tool for designers. Uh, where we create like wireframes and screens, also like a collaboration tool. And then, yeah, I also just using chat GPT to like summarize things uh, when we're doing like more early stage research and projects. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I've been using it, but not, I would say in like a high fidelity context, more in like a brainstorm, or like uh, immersion stage. Yeah. I'm curious if in your field, maybe you've seen an example of, or like seen someone just in the field that maybe goes too far with using AI. I don't, I don't know if there is, but I'd be curious to hear if you did have some sort of recent thing that happened where you were like, oh, wow, they're really using AI. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I would say. Like, yeah, I guess the idea of like craftsmanship is this tension again of people using AI to maybe even write like LinkedIn posts or like articles and this idea of like the creator and influence economy, like more output is like better. Um, I don't know if more directly in like my work work, but in my day to day, it yeah, it is kind of interesting this almost saturation of content, user-generated content, and this idea of like, is quality going down? I also was in part of a group of people on LinkedIn who's got early access to additional AI features. So like now when I'm in my LinkedIn feed, I get this prompt where it asks me if I want a summary of this post. So I just maybe don't even bother reading the LinkedIn post and just click that and it gives me a summary. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder like, cause I feel like I couldn't think of an example either in my work. I feel like it's kind of difficult, but it's, it's also interesting. Cause we talk so much about like the hype around AI and everyone's talking about it. But then like, when I do think about people using it, I actually haven't seen anyone using it in such crazy ways. So it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I was, I guess, I guess it's, um, I guess, I mean, I tried to use it for my research and it just doesn't work amazingly because, um, it just hallucinates too much because there isn't enough data, especially on the ones that don't have access to the internet. Um, so I guess if people just like use it and then try to go with it. Like I, I remember it kind of in the beginning when it came out where like some of my colleagues were like, um, like one of my colleagues, friends, um, he, he used it to get like an overview over literature. And then he looked for ages for this one article, which obviously didn't exist, but like, um, <laughs> But I think that's more a learning curve than using it too much. It's like too much reliance and then understanding, okay, I need to like kind of calibrate how much I trust this output. So it's more, I don't know if it's like um, too much reliance or if it's just like, an, at first I need to learn how it actually works, how well it works and when it works. 
Right. And this also this idea of like, we don't know if people used AI, I guess, like back in my day, like in high school, like if you plagiarize something like Wikipedia and like submit it, we would submit it through this like turnitin.com where it can mark, like, like figure out if you did plagiarize. Um, yeah. So this idea of like, how do we know? Uh, maybe that, yeah, it is being used more than we know. Yeah. Also how, like when I've heard it for like generating code that it's like really bad at generating code, specifically like chat GPT and large language models. Mm -hmm. So it is interesting. Like, is it how you prompt it or is it just bad at its job realistically? Mm -hmm. Um, And then you mentioned specifically right now too, about kind of this like plagiarism and identifying plagiarism. And that leads pretty well into a question I had for you about like disinformation with generative AI. And if you think that there's like specific ways to address the hype around it, um, for example, like when we talk about the the Pope example, um, should there be like policy regulating this? Should companies uh, be making you like force users if they want to use their platform to have to reveal that they are using generative AI or just anything you can imagine? Is there some sort of more specific ways that you envision addressing this? Yeah, I think there's like the levels, like I think uh, do you, like in the United States, there's uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Lindsey Graham, they're from different political parties and they came together to write this joint plea, like an article about how we need to like regulate kind of these tech platforms and companies in similar ways as we do with the oil industry, like at, at that level of intensity. Um, and so I feel like there's like that level, which is not something we can do as a day-to-day user of these platforms but another one is yeah like especially with like a younger generation like digital literacy is that whole realm is just like changing so fast I think um and especially something that scares me is like like now it's not Snapchat it's more TikTok like the filters using AI and it's so realistic this idea of like catfishing is like a whole rabbit hole that you can go down so I think as designers specifically, like thinking of almost as many edge cases as you can with these design tools and trying to put guardrails. Um, and so I like it's kind of like the analogy of like a garden. When you plant a garden, there's like weeds or like a like a I don't know, like some type of wasp can like kill your plants that you didn't anticipate. And so I think we have to like create ways to like clean up the mess as we go and also giving agency to users to like report or like um, help with this because it is kind of almost like a community driven thing that like not we can't like put it in one person's hands like completely Um, and so yeah I'm thinking more about like community efforts to uh, take care of these digital spaces that we share but also like a more higher level like the government policy level yeah. definitely um and then another thing I was wondering is about uh when you mentioned like the parallels between fashion and art and then AI do you envision some sort of way that you could maybe like harness these patterns or these uh like parallel parallelisms between them I guess in a way that could contribute to more responsible like data and I fu- and AI future like do you see that parallel? bringing in any new ideas to how we might address the issues that you've mentioned? Yeah, I think like one, my the first area I, my brain goes in is like, like just like the art community, fashion community at large and like um, kind of like how things hit mainstream. And like, I mean, like in the art community, hype is like everything kind of like, what is art? Like, why do we value something's the way we do and it's just like um this one's like clout that covers an artist and so I think similarly um yeah okay I think I don't know where I'm going with that but there's like one part and then the other part is like giving artists credit like credit for their work and this idea of like remixing ideas AI remixes basically everything it spits out and so how do we think about um yeah like transparency and giving proper like citation and credit especially when our ideas and content in general is just becoming more mashed up together um and so like the music industry that's like it's like when you collaborate with another artist it's so 
specific how you're supposed to give them credit and acknowledgements. And right now with AI generated content, it's not clear. And how do you regulate that? What's the like damages of not doing this carefully? Um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like I keep seeing, or just the, the past few months, I've seen it a few times, people saying it's like AI in the current regulation state is like the wild, wild west. Like it's like when you when you think about it, it is pretty crazy how lit, I mean, there's no regulation technically. So I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, and then another thing I want to ask kind of about this like hype is if you could say something to all the individuals that are like, I'm afraid of AI and AI will take over the world. Like, what would you say to them? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I would say that, yeah, like the whole idea of like, yeah, AI truly does live in the past and dream of the future. Like that whole sentiment kind of translates into this idea of like, uh, okay, well, my favorite book, I'm going to add this, is um, How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell. And then she talks about this idea of like decentering our like human point of view. And so to anyone that's scared of like a bot takeover, I would, you know, look outside and really try to think about, you know, there's elements of this world that truly will never be like uh, replicated in the digital space and just being really grounded in that. Um, and yeah, I mean, like every day we're like staring at these screens, like almost all day. <laughs> Um, and we can really lose sight of our surroundings. And so I would say, yeah, like, oh, also like this idea when you go to like a very small town, a rural town, and you go to like a restaurant, you sit down, you look at the menu, like the way they're like even designing their menus, something I noticed is like, they're still using like Word, like Microsoft Word to like create their menu. Whereas like some people are now like Canva, like 6.0 and like generating all these like really cool modern uh, groovy designs in like two seconds but like that type of process is really not you know like completely everywhere and so I think even though we're like oh my god like AI is everywhere in my life it's not like that for like a lot a lot of people and so I think it's going to take a while for us to like reach a point where truly like we can't escape it even when we go out in the forest and like a tree has some type of like AI sensor or something. Um, yeah, that was a bit of a tangent, but that's <laughs> no, I fully understood. I also love the the tree with an AI sensor because I think I was somewhere recently, like in some forest, and they had like a little QR code. And I was like, what am I scanning this QR code for? Like I don't even have Wi-Fi here. So I thought mm -hmm. that was interesting. Yeah. Um, I also fully agree with like your statement about just kind of stepping outside, stepping outside your bubble. And kind of, I feel like that's kind of like how the internet statement of people, how, how people are like, go outside and touch grass. Like, I think that's true sometimes too. It's like, remember that what you see isn't what everyone sees. And I really like that perspective. Yeah. Um, that's cool. uh, yeah. I'll go ahead and read out uh, Leah or Leah, not sure how you pronounced it, mentioned something. I can just read her comment. And she said, I read an article months ago about how doctors use generative AI to be more empathetic in what they say to their patients. This is one example of uh, how AI could sort of improve on relationship building or present our better selves to others. How do you think designers can help people make use of generative AI in this sense, but also not lose our unique sense of ethics, asking as a designer? Mm. Mm. That's a really good, that's a good question. Um, hmm, let me stew on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, again, it's the idea of AI can be used as like a jumping off point. And it gets really scary when we think of it as an end-all be-all. Um, and like I write how I think that's the point where we really lose, that's a dangerous like point where we like lose the sense of our like self. Um, yeah, so I think specifically... Yeah, so I guess you're asking, like, how do we not lose that sense of ourself? And, hmm. Yeah, I think always being skeptical and critical. I think, like, the moment when we kind of hand over too much, then 
that's the problem, especially I think designers, that's our whole job is to think of like the worst case scenario of something. And so even though these tools can do what we do at some level, um, they're bounded by whatever data set or like data source that they're using to like spit out an output. But we can like look up, like twist our heads, like go and every angle and kind of like run towards whatever piques our interest. And so I would say, yeah, just as a designer, always be critical, always be skeptical. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. These, I feel like these questions have so many answers that it's difficult to, to put it in one. Um, yeah. But I think that's great. Definitely skepticism is a big piece to it. Yeah, I also um, think like in design, I feel like conceptual thinking is going to become a more of a like important skill set for designers. So instead of just like the craft, but thinking really like critically, strategically about like, are we even asking the right questions? Are we solving the right thing? Like problem, like are we in the right problem space to begin with? Um, and so like, yeah, like having a more like high level sense of like a systems thinking like mindset more so than like being so nitty gritty lost in the details um, is something I also might think might be more of an importance. Um, yeah. Nice, thank you. Um, I'll also open up the floor again if anyone has any other questions because I'm on to my last question. So yeah, if anyone wants to put something in the chat or just interrupt me, feel free to. Um, but my question is just kind of a wrap up and to ask you like, in a perfect world, how would you envision the way forward uh, in our AI world? Kind of focusing on the theme of our publication of like revisions of now and future. What do you envision to kind of be perfect is a strong word, but a better AI future in a perfect world? Yeah. Hmm. This is maybe like, <laughs> this is where my mind goes right now. And it might be a hot take, but maybe like having like an escape button almost. Like, I think it's like a a, a future with like AI. It's like, fine, we're already, kind of, we're there. We're, it's here, it's now. But also like not becoming super, like a hundred percent reliant on it. Um, Like it would be so scary if we like can't write a paper ourselves and like I guess why would that be scary there's like something about that process that like um of writing a paper that would be lost um and so yeah I would say a like a better a future with AI that would be ideal is where it's almost like enhancing us in a way but not completely taking over us and I mean that in more like our values and our interests and our opinions and ideas um yeah thank you cool um I think we don't have any other questions so I'll thank you one more time um also I think I believe you're on our online community on circle so if anyone who's watching this recording had any questions I'm sure you could totally message Yuna make a post on our circle community for AI and equality um, and yeah, thank you once more for being here. This was such a wonderful talk and we really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, it's great because I feel like I wrote this so long ago that um, just making like that slide deck and there's just so many more examples <laughs> since then um, that I can like add, but I think we'll be okay. <laughs> um, that's, that's a very positive ending. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Good.